All right, this is the gag on this podcast. I am Big Nick. I'm joined always by my Portuguese lover that is Rob. How's it going? I'm joined by the Italian stallion, Danny D. Hey. We have honorary guest hosts who once he heard Zach Amico was coming on, he had to come on, <laughs> Josh Means. Woo-hoo. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. And then we have the amazing New York-based comic, Zach fucking amico Woo-hoo. thank you for having me guys very very sweet of you well i am so happy you came on i was first introduced to you on um it was a legion of skanks episode where they dissected your roast battle with karen feehan ah many moons ago yes yeah, yeah that was like it's got to be like four or five years ago now i think i think what sucks is um there's no video that says Karen Feehan versus Zach Amico. Like it still says Karen Feehan versus nerdy fat guy or gets destroyed no, it's, by it's, nerdy. It's yeah. It's a uh, hot chick gets destroyed by uh, a nerdy, nerdy something, but it was so weird. So like that video, I saw that on went, Pornhub. Thank you. <laughs> that video went viral and the, the websites that would list it, the, the, the titles got more and more insulting to me. <laughs> so it started as like you know hot chick gets destroyed by nerdy comedian and then it was like hot chick gets destroyed by chubby guy and then hot chick <laughs> gets destroyed by fat comic and then it was like literally like fat slob yells at hot woman for 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> i did see all those titles on porno <laughs> zach do you think there's a porn with you in it out there that i've worked on yeah um <laughs> i wrote one i uh, many years ago i wrote one in exchange for i make uh, horror movies and uh, in exchange for my equipment on one of the movies i made i wrote a gay porno wow and it is out there somewhere i've never i've seen screenshots of it i've never seen the i've never seen the movie in the wild what what's the, goes into what's the plot okay we all i got a different question yeah. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? It was it was a pretty good plot. <laughs> I'm listening. Uh, it was called Fucked Famous. And it was about like a... Um, Harvey oh, Weinstein. Somebody that would be like a SoundCloud rapper now, but like a Jeffree Star type, like, oh. like a MySpacey kind of dude who makes music. And he sells his soul to Satan to be famous. But then every time guys hear his music, it makes them gay. Is it about Jeffree Star? Because that sounds exactly like his story. <laughs> uh, I named him Justin Eclipse. <laughs> Does Satan get it on with a guy? That's the uh, first sex scene in it is uh, Justin Eclipse having sex with Satan. And Justin, I've seen screenshots. This is the scene I've seen screenshots of. Uh, the guy who plays Justin Eclipse is like this little Twinkie guy. And Satan's like this big muscle bear. Oh, God. And uh, Justin Eclipse goes, gee, Satan, I don't know if I want to sell you my soul. And then the devil goes, I don't want your soul. I want your hole. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> clears his desk and fucks him in the ass on it. Uh, I'll have to look for that one. Yeah. But- and then when I wrote it, they were like, do you want your name on it? And I was like, no. So I signed um, my high school principal's name as the screenwriter. Oh, nice. oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere there's a gay porn of that says it was uh, written by Patrick and Pev- <laughs> oh <my laughs> Pretty specific name. <laughs> That's fucking awesome, man. That is awesome. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk about your Midnight Spook show. Um, specifically, I've heard of most of your videos that you go over. The one that caught my eye was Love at First Bark. Oh, uh, Love on a Leash. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, Love at First Bark is the uh, tagline of the movie. How, how did you find that? Okay, so I, uh, I, I like to think of myself as an aficionado of unwatchable movies. <laughs> uh, I, just lo- I, I love, um, and that's one of my favorite genres is the bad talking animal movie. Uh, I also just recently reviewed one called A Talking Cat? Question mark. Uh, that's uh, written and directed by a guy who does like uh, softcore gay porn and the cat is voiced by Eric Roberts and uh, you could tell he did all of his lines in like 15 minutes because it's like one take of everything 
Uh, but love, so love on a leash. I had heard about through a few friends who also watch really bad movies. And the, the selling point for me before I even knew what it was, was that there's no music. Uh, and it's a feature length film with shots that are like definitely supposed to have music (laughs) and it's just (laughs) silent. (laughs) So my assumption would be whoever made it, which I found out later had put music in it, realized they didn't own the rights to that music so just stripped it and released it with all these big silent like establishing shots and that's once we were watching it doesn't make sense it's a uh, a girl falls in love with a dog but the dog becomes a man at nighttime but if they find true love he'll be a man all the time and he can talk but then when he turns into a man he's got a different voice than the voice <laughs> of the dog uh, and then we found out later it was written and directed by an Asian lady in her 80s who somehow came into money and decided to be a filmmaker. So not only like, and it makes a lot more sense because you're like, what? nobody's speaking English correctly in it. Um, like, they're like, that's not how people talk. And then you watch it and you realize, oh, the person who wrote it probably does not have a great grasp on English. <laughs> Um, and it's it's real. But like I watched that with Mike Cannon and Paul Hooper. And for people, just for context, the show uh, usually right now uh, I've been doing clip shows where I suggest different movies and show trailers just during the pandemic. But um, usually it's me and two or three other comic friends watching uh, either a horror movie, genre movie, B movie, uh, whatever I felt like uh, putting on. Excuse me, I had to burp. Rockstar. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you are aficionado. You, I actually learned a lot of stuff about movies from you, like the Milo and Otis thing. I remember you said on, I think it was Legion of Skanks. Oh, yeah, they just, like, willy-nilly, like, believe it or First of all, that's another thing. People don't realize that was a Japanese production. So, like, they just went to craft services. <laughs> 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 like, there's a scene in Milo and Otis with a cat in a the river. They threw, like, nine cats in that river. Oh my god! <laughs> well, and didn't you say also there's a scene where one of them's hobbling and they just broke the dog's leg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They oh, <laughs> the dog's supposed to have a limp, so I think they just broke its leg and shot it. Oh, that's insane. Whatever works. But then you, I remember you also talked about there was some cannibal movie that was made in Japan where they. I guess they killed a, a turtle or some shit. Oh, no, no, no. That's Cannibal Holocaust. That is an Italian movie that was shot in um, South America. And that has uh, two real animal deaths in it. They kill a tortoise and then, like, um, some type of, like, feral pig. But what happened was actually they were – they had, like, natives actually butcher them because it was what they were going to eat that night. And they oh. just filmed it, included it in the movie. But – um so it's a mockumentary and um there's a few deaths in it that look so real that the people that made the movie had to show the actors in court to prove that they didn't kill them wow and uh, they had to show how they did like there's a scene where they come up on this village of these cannibals and there's a woman with a pole going up her and out her mouth and they had to show how they did it with a bicycle seat and how they shot around that you couldn't see that she was seated Wow. wow. That sounds pretty good that, you know, they had to prove that they were still alive. I mean, I don't really watch scary movies now, so I'm probably... Yeah, that was, um, that's uh, directed by uh, Ruggiero Diodato, and he did uh, a bunch of, like, uh, there was, like, a whole cannibal kind of, like, South American genre that came out of Italy in the 70s and 80s, and he was uh, one of the filmmakers that were responsible for that. So, not to change subjects, Nick, if this is all right, uh, how long have you been doing comedy? Uh, I just hit, I think, 11 years uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, awesome. And have you always been pretty much like New York based? or? You- yeah, I started at, um, I was going to NYU and I took a comedy class, a class called the History of Comedy in New York, which it just should have been called Jews. <laughs> <laughs> And our final was to either write a 20-page paper or do five minutes of stand-up oh, five at, a, sure. at a real club. And the guy that booked that club 
watched us, and he had Dante Nero, Dave Smith, Justin Silver, and a few other people come, like, work with us, uh, Dante being the main one. And then we did, like, a class show, and then after three years of that class, they did, like, a best of at Caroline's. Cool. And um, uh, it was myself and Rachel Bloom from My Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Okay. And we opened for Big J. Okay. And his manager at the time asked me if I really wanted to do stand-up, and he would start giving me check spots at the club he ran. Nice. And then uh, I wound up losing my job, and he made me like a doorman ticket guy for that club. So, yeah, and that was right around 10, 10 years ago and change right now. That's amazing. Yeah, Big J is pretty cool. Uh, I like watching his comedy. He's, he definitely has inspired me to do comedy. Like, He's I, I my just, favorite of all time. I love him. So. You did more than love him. I had sex with him. But <laughs> either, neither here nor there. That doesn't matter. So exact. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Not really much to talk about. He knows. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> if I was going to go around this five-person chat with Who <laughs> Fucked Jay, those would be the top two in that order. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked him with two of my girlfriends, so we like we had a foursome. It was like a long time ago. You and Jay by yourself is a foursome. <laughs> Fuck you. Oh, and they were both bigger girls, too. Like, both my size girls. Fuck you. I'm not I, that big. I, I believe it. Yeah, so, uh, but it was a long time ago. Like, he did, he looks so much better now. He had the That's not an orgy, that's on. a Royal Rumble. <laughs> <laughs> we, we broke some shit that night. We definitely did. But, uh, yeah, your father's hearts. <laughs> <laughs> My dad knew I was a slut a long time ago. It's fine. <laughs> so, how did you get mixed up with uh, Big J and Louis J. Gomez? Because, um, you know, other than LOS and the Midnight Spook Show, you're also co-host of uh, the Real Ass Podcast with Lewis. Yep, and that's every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Gas Digital Network. Um, so that uh, comedy club booker who uh, took me from that class, he was a manager at the time, and I think his roster was Jay, Patrice, Voss, Bonnie, Dave Smith, Justin, like um, just a ton of people that I wound up being friends with. And I would work the door and do check spots at this club called CB's Comedy Club that was down the street from the cellar underneath an Italian restaurant. And those were the guys that were all on it. So in my first week of comedy was the week Geraldo died and a bunch of people called out sick because oh, yeah. they didn't want to do spots. And that's how I got my first week of spots. Wow. wow. And Lewis met me and wrote hammer fisting across my arm with a Sharpie to get him to subscribe to his podcast before people had podcasts <laughs> uh, back when it was like him and Dave in Lewis's bedroom with one microphone. <laughs> and we were just had, always, yeah. Back when he had sport and he was uh, first had his kid like back then. Back when he had his dog and family. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, he, uh, then we just became, we were always kind of friends. And then he was going to do a demo for what became the Real Ass Podcast. And I think I was supposed to be the, I was supposed to be the producer, but I have no technical skills. <laughs> and uh, I wound up just uh, being like, not even a co host. I was just in the room with a microphone for like a year. Uh, and then eventually I started talking. Yeah. When you and guys, yeah, now, now we're about five years into that. When you guys first started, it was you two and Chris Tinkle, wasn't it? And it was actually myself and Lewis. Then we added Chris Scopo, who used to be on YKWD. And then we added Tinkle. So for a while, it was wow. four of us. And then I bullied Chris Scopo off the show. <laughs> uh, no, he just, he was just, he wanted to do other stuff. He wasn't enjoying it uh, like we were. And then Tinkle wound up moving back to San Francisco, and it became just me and Lewis again. So I have to ask this. Uh, do you follow the uh, Real Ass Podcast and LOS uh, Reddits? I try not to look anymore uh, because it's. Uh, I try not to read YouTube comments anymore, which is very difficult. Uh, and Reddit, I try. I mean, it's hard. It's like, it's like having addiction issues. I try not to, though, because A, people are vicious, and I just don't want to read people being shitty for no reason. 
And B, I don't, I found myself when I used to read it more, I was placating to those people mm. to try and make them laugh instead of a broader audience. So I don't want to, um, I don't ever want to be the person who's trying to make five guys on the internet laugh. They never I, laugh. I, and it's like, it's not worth, it's not worth placating to them and losing a bigger audience. And then like, it's also like lowering yourself to their level where you have to shit on people to feel good about yourself. Which is funny because you do roast battles like, like no one else I've seen. So, I mean, you, you're like, oh, I don't like shitting on people. Like when people shit on people, but you're really good at it. You're well, really good at it. I think there's always, battle. like, I try to be nice about it. Like, I always, like, try to be, like, like we're having fun. Yeah, well, that's what you're supposed to do. I, I hope I do that most of the time. And, like, I think that's people's biggest mistake with Rose Battle is they just say mean things and don't have fun with it. Yeah. So, like, if I were to say something mean and then you said something mean back, I have to laugh, too, or else we're just being mean to each other. Yeah, well, you should know when you sign up for a roast battle, it's all fun and games. Like, you're not just going up there to get, like, sensitive and feelings hurt. Like, what the fuck? Uh, you would be – I mean, even in the New York version of the live show, I've seen people – I saw a guy <laughs> – I saw a guy walk off the stage. He was losing so bad. Wow. Yeah, cool. and he ran – he just went home. Like, he just walked off stage and went home. Jesus. Well, Josh has been part of one battle. It was um, Joe Making Lopez versus – Joey Stoltz. Do you remember oh, that one? Talking, yeah. The, yeah, somebody had a breakdown and, like, started to have PTSD. It, was, it wasn't great. But I don't know. Yeah. I, I feel like roast battles are the place to say something mean, though. Like Zach was saying, yeah. YouTube comments, you don't want to put out a video of yourself and then go on there and then just see people talking shit about you. Like, a roast battle, you're expecting it. The way I well, think about YouTube fair. comments – is so like uh think about the amount of videos you've ever watched on youtube how many of them have you commented on <laughs> literally um. right and imagine taking the time to comment to watch and comment on something you don't like like there's videos i love that i wouldn't comment on because i don't give a shit yeah. i can't imagine having the lack of life where i have to watch an entire video especially if it's like a podcast you watch a two-hour show of people you don't like <laughs> yeah. that's what i don't understand about that seth simons dude like he's he's always on top of everybody's podcast but it's like you you've been listening to every fucking podcast i don't, <laughs> I don't dude that that article that's like oh, it's something like the 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 rise of the seething underground of stand-up comedy that gave birth to shane gillis and they accuse all of it, like me, basically just me and my friends of all being all right. And when he does this, he does this paragraph of like shitty things each one of us have said, and it reads funny. Yeah. Yeah. Like even reading it out of context, it's like, it's literally like comedian Ari Shafir took his penis out on stage and made it speak like a puppet. That's, <laughs> that's a funny sentence. <laughs> Much alone if you were there. Yeah. Well, Josh, didn't you win the naked roast battle in at Skank Fest? Yeah. Two, two years ago? No, the, uh, ju that was last year. Okay, yeah. Uh, against Rob Ryan. Yeah, I believe I, I told you you look like a guy uh, that they find chained up at the bottom of a pirate ship. Yeah. <laughs> so were the judges naked too? Like, was everyone or just like the roaster? Yeah, no, judges? everybody. Uh, the Myself, the host. And then uh, the judges, everybody's got to be naked. Uh, the funniest was the second year, one of the judges was Earl Skakel. And he didn't realize, so he was sitting at the judge's table, but it was just like a folding table. And he thought there was a, a flag or like a tablecloth on it. And it was on an elevated stage. So every time he sat down, he thought he was blocked. And he was jerking off, trying to stay like three quarters hard, but he didn't know that there was 500 people watching him jerk off in between each battle. Hilarious. <laughs> Do you guys make it cold on purpose? Because it was it was so cold in that room. No, it hits you because like we we actually like tried to address that, and there's just no way. It's like you're your body makes all the warmth leave you 
because you're so terrified. Yeah. Yeah, fuck. That was... Also, I feel like everybody just started getting naked, like, right away. So I felt pressured to get naked right away, and we were, like, the second-to-last battle. So I was just sitting back there in the corner That's naked. so fucking awkward. <laughs> oh, my God. But it was Dude, so I did much a, fun. I did a show at a nudist colony once. Mm. Wow. And they went, do you, the lady literally went, are you guys comfortable performing nude? And I was like, lady, I got naked in the car. <laughs> <laughs> it was the weirdest. It was like all old people, yeah. like all old people. And right before the show, it was me and two girls. And the lady that ran the, the nudist colony, which we were not allowed to call a colony. Cause I guess that's, um, they, they don't like that verbiage. I think we had to call it like a resort. Uh, <laughs> She goes, hey, just so you, just so you guys know, uh, everybody's cold and they're going to go inside and get clothes. And we're like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> and then they all came out and all the men just put on T-shirts. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, like, they were all just porky pig in it. <laughs> Full dick out. And it was so, dude, I just remember the lady that ran the thing, she, like, takes us, she had, they had like, a barbecue or whatever. And she's talking to us. And she's got on a sundress. And she told us she had clothes on because she was cooking. And one of the rules there is if you're cooking, you got to wear clothes. Makes sense. And she's talking to us about, you know, what not to say on stage. She goes, you know, we've had comedians here before. <laughs> and uh, they all just, you know, they want to make fun of the nudist and say it's weird. But it's not. Okay? It's our lifestyle. So I wouldn't go up there and try and crack jokes about how everybody's naked. And what I need you to remember is that we're all just nice, normal people. And as she said, nice, normal people, she took her glasses off and went to rub the lenses with the bottom of her dress and just showed me her pussy. <laughs> <laughs> was it shaved? Yeah, do everybody was shaved. The entire thing was old people completely shaved. Wow. Huh. Weirdest thing is taking a shit and then walking back out <laughs> naked. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. You don't feel right. <laughs> you feel like an animal in the woods. <laughs> like, it's, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Um, so I do, I, I want to get back to what I was talking about with the LOS and rap reddits. I just want to ask this because I think people, it seems to be the talk of the town. Um, what do you guys like about Mark Random? <laughs> You're asking the wrong <laughs> person. Because <laughs> I know that is a big thing. That's a, uh, a lot of people have consternation about bringing Random back all the time. <laughs> um, he is an acquired taste, to say the least. Uh, my co-host, Lewis, has a very big heart, and I think he sees a lot of, and I do too, the more vulnerable side of ourselves in him. The like the the desperately wanting people to like him, so he kind of says crazy shit, which we all do, but he's just really bad at it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think Lewis has a big heart and really does genuinely want to teach him how to be better and funnier, and he just hasn't figured it out yet. Who would you um, rather? Who would you rather have as a guest on the Spook Show, Random or that plumber from the Real Ass Podcast last? Ra week? Random, one hundred percent. That says a lot right there. If you'd rather have random. Yeah, that was a bad one. That was uh that was a that was not a great day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um Rob, Josh and I are big wrestling fans and you are part of the Capital Wrestling, right? Yeah, we actually just rebranded um about a month ago. We are now Catalyst Wrestling. Uh, we're going a different direction. We uh, had some changes in the ownership and creative uh, team, but yeah. So now I am, yeah, I, uh, I'm a performer, and now I'm uh, actually going to be uh, involved in the creative process as well. Hell yeah! Very You're cool. a wrestler, like you wrestle. Uh, I'm a manager. Oh, you okay. had a death match though. But I, I have, say, um, you, I've yeah, had, I've had, I've had four matches now. Wow. Um, and m mostly it's just me getting my ass kicked in in various stupid ways. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm a man. I'm a, I'm a mouthpiece. I have a, like a little heel stable of uh, uh, rejects and uh, one. I, the one guy I manage is phenomenal. 
Uh, his name is the Meadowlands Monster. He's seven feet tall. Oh my God. And I manage him in uh, two different companies, a catalyst and another company called uh, Pro Wrestling Magic oh. in New Jersey. And uh, he's really he's, he's going to get signed and leave me in the dust. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I uh, yeah I'm like a heel authority figure. Uh, another comic, Harry Turjanian, actually plays the owner of Catalyst Wrestling, and he's the lead announcer. Oh, okay. So who would you say you based your managerial style off of? Like Paul, oh, Paul Bear, 100. percent Oh, nice. It's uh, Paul Bear. Uh, the way I originally pitched because I'd seen Meadowlands Monster uh, setting up the ring for another company, and we were there doing something. And I see the seven foot guy running the ropes in two steps. And then I come to find out he can do the undertaker walk across the ropes. Oh shit. And I went to them. I went, that's who I, that's who I manage. And I went, we're basically the way I pitched us was Jay and silent Bob meet undertaker and Paul bear. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. uh, and then I've stolen a few things from uh, uh, Michael PSAs. I take some of his cadence uh, the blue meanie I steal a lot of mannerisms from. And then when I'm getting combative, uh, Jim Cornette. Oh, I love that guy. Fuck, that guy's great. Do you yeah, I play the, um, uh, the, the head of talent development is my, uh, my official fake title <laughs> in the company. Sounds very important. I was going to say, do you know who we're talking about, Danny? I have no fucking idea. I know, yeah, it doesn't matter. I'll just sit here and listen to Boy Talk. <laughs> you guys put on some good matches though the live one at Skankfest last year was so much fun that was our best i think that was our best show ever that was so much fucking fun. like uh the crowd was so hot for that and they like they just yeah. played along like they booed the bad guys they cheered the good guy like it was just everybody played their role and had so much fun and yeah that one was out of this world and that was um yeah we had homicide on that one we had colby carina who are Who's our champion now? That was a really, really good one. Who's your favorite wrestler of all time? Owen Hart. Nice. Owen Hart, and then right behind him is Foley. Um, but yeah, Owen was my favorite when I was little, and then I I became like a big Cactus Jack Mark after that. I still the hell in the cell between Undertaker and Mankind is but that will go down in the history books for me. It's the number one thing you would show people when you need to be like these are the the, the toughest people on earth possibly. Oh yeah. What would and be even just training the few times like so I trained with a guy named Deranged who was like um and this is a very nerdy thing very nerdy he was like a a, a, a Ring of Honor original. The some of the guys that run Catalyst Wrestling are from like that first couple years of Ring of Honor. And even just training with them, taking bumps, running the ropes, uh, was unlike any. And I've done fight scenes in movies. I wrestled growing up, but I couldn't walk the next day. Like I, my wife had to pull me out of bed, <laughs> like because I just could. I couldn't get my hips out to get my feet on the floor. Oh. And that was just a day of like practicing back bumps. The ring feels so soft when you step on it, and the second you start falling on your back in it, you. It, knocks the wind out of you every time that doesn't sound like fun <laughs> what would be your like go-to owen hart match to show somebody because my son's been getting into wrestling and he likes the blue blazer we showed him a little bit of the documentary the dark side of the ring episode um but i want to show him an owen hart match owen really? brett wrestlemania 10 yeah that's the one i was thinking of too also, Owen Shawn Michaels is really, really good from right before that. Okay. Or right, pro, excuse me, after that, before Shawn and Brett had their Iron Man match, it was a really good Owen Brett match. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, I lost my fucking spot on these notes, God damn it! I need to write better. <laughs> hey, Danielle, have you seen the scar on my forehead from wrestling? No. Yeah, let's see if it shows up. See that line? Yes. Yes. Oh, All shit. All the way across. Yeah. yeah. What'd you do? Uh, the guy I was, this is my first match ever was a, uh, a death match. So there was no rules and weapons. And he split a fluorescent light tube over my forehead. Oh. And it broke jagged and went in one end and slit my whole head open to the other side. And uh, they had to throw out the ring canvas 
because I covered it the entire mat in blood. I thought wrestling was fake. Like I didn't know. Like, are you yeah, I've kidding been, me? Um, I've been hit with light tubes. I got hit with a um, uh, plastic baseball bat covered in thumbtacks. Oh. I went a through a bad scar on your face. Yeah. Like, I went through a table covered in barbed oh. wire. Oh my god! Yeah, that was all my first match. And, and you, you like, like you like all this? Like this is just like what it was really awesome. fun. Yeah, it was really okay. it, it was it was it was the most fun. Like it was everything I wanted. Oh good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it fulfilled something <laughs> for you. And we had a we both sat in um metal folded chairs and took turns uh staple gunning each other's face. Oh fuck, what that's like straight out of you? that's like new jack <laughs> shit, man. Yeah. Yeah, wild. it was awesome. Yeah, like, what, what kind of what? drugs do you do, Zach? That was a stone cold sober for that. Painkillers after. No. No? Ugh. No, I haven't I haven't done painkillers since my early twenties. I quit. Ah. You're just one of those sick guys that like girls to like step on his balls and like just cause him pain and shit. Like yeah. it wouldn't be yeah. That would I'm no stranger <laughs> to that. In between the naked roast battles, he's got this chick stapling money to him and Oh man. I don't want to give away everything, but it's it's wild. <laughs> Fuck. I don't even like stubbing my toe. I would be really upset if someone tried to staple. Oh, you know what? Some motherfucker bit me three weeks ago and caused this huge mark on my back. And uh, season's closed now because of it. I don't like pain at all. I can't believe that you would sign up Man, to get hit. Phone sex has been getting crazy these days. They let you bite people. Now? <laughs> Fuck, it was a real person. Oh. Okay. And real sex. I don't just have phone sex, Josh. People what? do want to fuck big girls. What do you I'm think about that, that, Zach? Can't confirm. <laughs> What do you think about that, Zach, that phone sex operators is still a thing? It's got to be, like, old people or foreign people, right? No. Um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of married guys who, wants, who have fantasies. Like, one guy wants, you know, his wife to be turned out by a bunch of, like, black guys. And, you know, just, like, why he watches. But his wife doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to talk to his wife about it. Or there's another guy that, like, is on the bad end of the glory hole and he like goes home he's like a dentist during the day he goes to the glory hole and then he has to go home to his family but he's having a hard time dealing with it now spit <laughs> so you know i just a lot of secrets of their weird ass fucking kinks like one guy has sex with a sister and you know they don't want to tell like people they love these things so they'll tell a stranger i've been really busy since the pandemic so <laughs> i don't give a shit oh yeah Pretty sure I heard a guy fuck a goat last week. Pretty sure. You never know. But it's all anonymous. I mean, I mean, my pictures are on there, but like, you know, they don't know who the fuck they're talking to. They don't know. The weirdest was the, uh, Zach, do you know what an ookie cookie is? Yeah, well, yes, in, in London, it's also known as soggy biscuit. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. You know what a Sacramento turtleneck is? That's no, please tell uh, me. Um, it's also it's called something else in Canada, but basically you fuck a chick in the ass. It has to be a, an ethnic girl because apparently mm -hmm. they have hairy asses. You put syrup around your dick, and then when you're pulling out, the hair looks like a turtleneck around your dick. I follow you. That's Sacramento's claim to fame right there. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. Sacramento's hella hot. What We don't wear turtlenecks. <laughs> no. That's the only time you do. <laughs> All right. Josh is more of a chili dog kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> a chili dog is where you shit on a girl's chest and then titty fuck her. Oh, <laughs> no. oh, I, I shit on a man's chest once for $1,000. Where does the cheese come in? But, um, oh. Ew. That's a cleanliness <laughs> issue. Josh. <laughs> I really like chili dogs. Don't ruin this for me, you guys. Stop it. But, so, Zach, what would you say you prefer doing more, roasting or uh, stand-up? Stand-up, because you can work on that longer, um, and I, I enjoy doing my act. Roast, roasting, it's, it's too much pressure to write new shit constantly, and I hate when people just uh, redo jokes and change the person they're about and change, like, two words and uh it's just so much writing and then you're so nervous that it's not gonna work i'd rather do my act and be relaxed and have fun now one thing we've heard from people that have done roast battles um is when you're roasting 
a lot of times you're roasting people that the audience has no idea about. And Josh, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong. Um, they said make your roast jokes all about physical yes. features and things yeah. that they can see. But when you roasted Karen Feehan, you talked about um, how her stomach is filled with black guys cum. And that's not necessarily a physical thing. <laughs> So the the easiest thing, well, the mistake a lot of people make is they'll write inside jokes about the person's life or whatever, but not tee it up. So you don't want to tell an entire story. Like, you don't want to have, like, a fucking prologue. But if you say something like, so-and-so has PTSD or so-and-so used to do this for a living, then you can tee it up, but you got to do it quick or else it, it takes too long and people don't give a shit anymore. Or if it takes too long between that and the punchline, people forgot what you told them in the beginning of the joke. Hmm. And also, like, I'm a big, fat, ugly guy who makes fun of women, primarily <laughs> in roast battles. So, like, I can't... Nobody wants to watch me call a girl fat and ugly. <laughs> it's not fun for anybody, and it's not accurate. It's, it's, it's more fun to, to get, get them on... Uh, things that hurt their feelings well one thing that was said when they were dissecting your roast battle is they felt karen feehan didn't do a good job because all she did was attack your physical features do you think you can do that too much yeah if all the jokes aren't funny um, <laughs> um it's good to move it around like not just do one unless it's a theme and you're going to have some real big pop at the end where it all ties together. Yeah, you don't want to do five jokes about the same thing. Josh, anything to add? No, I, I try to switch it up too. Like you don't want to just talk about people's appearance. Sometimes that is all you know, but you can also add in that their brother died or... Yeah, you can lie about it. I mean, it well, I mean, yeah, that necessarily too, but... have to be true. Yeah, I try to make it as true as possible mm. well you're better at roast than me you're so mean sometimes it's great mm. <laughs> and you it. were on josh's verbal insults as a judge recently how would you uh, think of the experience i had a good time it's very weird to watch people do the whole roast thing with no um audience and i think people kind of get dejected when they don't hear big laughs for stuff that they know is funny uh, but it was a fun experiment and it was fun to, you know, see people, uh, from different points in their comedy career from a different place and what they interpret the show as. Cause it's, um, it's definitely got its own style that's different from the New York and LA versions. Yeah. And just being on zoom is like terrible for all of us. Like, I don't, we do not like not being able to have that live audience, which uh, comedy clubs are opening back up here in Sacramento this week, so maybe we can get back. Oh, that's great. Soon. But, yeah, I don't know. Everybody's not really liking it. They does not feel the same. Yeah. Well, and they're doing 25% capacity, so that's going to be interesting. Well, it'll just be like any other fucking uh, open mic around here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, maybe not a comedy show, but at least it's something. At least it's something. Now, Zach, you've done comedy on the West Coast as well? Yeah, I've um, yeah, I've done L.A., uh, San Francisco. I've I, I've I've toured a little bit. Would you do you have to tailor your act to be a little different for the West Coast than the East? I am very tri-state area. I know my demo. <laughs> um, my if you put me without a microphone in front of a bunch of forty-five-year-old dudes from Hoboken, they will be laughing. Like this, I just know who I who I appeal to. L.A. is difficult for me, especially like an alt room or a bar show that's a little more highbrow. Uh, a because my act's very dirty. B because I think people not from New York think I speak aggressively. Yeah. When in reality, I'm ju that's just a product of my accent and and, and my tone. Uh, so I think people think I'm like more of a mean comic than I am when I'm in LA. So I do have to speak a little softer and I do have to kind of like, like, all right guys, this next one's dirty, but just stick with me. And I kind of, I, I do find myself um, catering is not the right word, but almost like preparing 
the audience that this is going to be a little different than the other people you see. But I'm also at the point now where most places I'm opening for somebody and the audience might even know me from podcasts. So anyone that's there is there for us, not necessarily because it says comedy on the marquee. So that's easy. I could just be me. Yeah, I've always wondered because, yeah. yeah, some people out here are like, oh, New York comedy is too rough. Mm, that's my dream. Boston, New York comedy. Mm. Right. Is, it, um, is it hard to like, are there a lot of mics? And I don't know. I don't think you go to any mics or anything, but like, are there a lot of rooms or a lot of opportunities to do comedy out in New York? Like, if someone would Not for visit? free. Not for free. Okay. There are places like the Creek in the Cave is phenomenal. The Creek in the Cave always takes care of comics first and they always make sure there's a place to perform. And there's a few rooms like that, but more and more in New York from what I'm told. And from what I remember, even as I kind of graduated out of that mm -hmm. was that there were more and more places that were um, just an extra way for the club to make money at five o'clock. And it would be these, um, companies that ran the mics as opposed to like a person whose oh. passion is running the mic okay. but yeah there's always you can always as long as it's normal and not the end of the world like right now there's yeah. plenty of places to get up you say you gotta pay i mean how much are we talking about to like get up for like five minutes uh usually like a drink and probably like five bucks ten bucks okay. for some of the places got it it's which like if you're doing too. it for if you're doing it for a week, that's fine. But if you're 22 years old and you're trying to get up every night, yeah. you know, you could be out 40 bucks a night, 50 bucks a night when you're not making that much uh, in the daytime. And are any clubs sending people out to look for people there or no? Uh, very rarely. Yeah. You're performing for other open micers or very rare. Like one thing I've noticed about especially New York is um, nobody goes to open mics as a – like. I've heard of other cities where they're like, let's go to the local open mic night yeah. and see people try comedy. Never. Because there's too many professional shows. Like, uh, you know, if yeah. you want to go to a comedy show, there's 10 clubs a night running shows with very competent, to say the least, if not brilliant lineups. Yeah, even like the lower end shows there are way better than any open mic you're going to go to. Mm -hmm. That's right. So well, that's I awesome. wanted... What, you're going to say something, Danny? Nope, go right ahead. Yeah, I think if you're in New York, you're better off, instead of concentrating on mics, uh, booking a bar show with professional comics mm -hmm. and hosting it. Um, that's what I mean. I, I did, like, three years just hosting bar shows. Okay. And, like, that was kind of my boot camp more than um, doing mics because you, if you book real comics and you're kind of in between, you have to get funnier faster. Yeah. as opposed to trying to uh, be at a level of other open micers. So let's talk about your collaboration with Lloyd Kaufman and Troma Studios, man. Yeah, what do you want? So I've done um, uh, three movies with Troma now. Uh, I assist uh, – the, the term that I've been uh, – the, the role I've been given is uh, called associate director, which doesn't really exist. Um, uh, James Gunn got it on our movie Tromeo and Juliet. He went on to make the Guardians of the Galaxy films. Uh, and yeah, I, uh, I kind of help direct. I direct a lot of the background actors or some of the smaller roles. I run the rehearsals and then I help people with like improv lines. So like uh, the three movies I've done with them now are um, Return to Newcomb High, which is a sequel to Class of Newcomb High from the 80s. We did Return to Newcomb High volumes one and two. And most recently, we have a movie coming out probably in a few months from now. We finished shooting it last summer called Hashtag Shakespeare's Shitstorm, which yeah. is our version of uh, uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest. Is that trauma the same that did uh, uh, Toxic Avenger? Yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. That's uh, but, uh, This is that there. Like 40 they, years ago. Yeah, they've been together. For, uh, Lloyd and Michael, the guys that run the company, they're coming up. They're staring down the battle barrel of, I think, 50 years to make a movies. Wow. Um, yeah, so and then yeah, the new one should be uh, out. Hopefully, uh, we were going to shoot for this summer, but all the film festivals have been put on hiatus. Uh, but we do have a movie coming out eventually once people are allowed at movie theaters again. Rob, did you see Toxic Avenger? 
love Toxic Avenger. I think the Okay, uh, my kid just popped up. Uh, <laughs> Great, now I got to put a kid shows up on YouTube. Son of a bitch. Oh, quit complaining. I don't think he real. I'm going to have like a bunch of views yeah. and it's going to be from people jerking I, off to his kid. I just show up and run my fucking mouth. I don't actually edit or do anything. Been- You're not going to get views. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you but- know one's going to watch you. But- yeah, the I'm blind girl in Toxic Avenger is gorgeous. The blind girl? Yes. Yes, toxic, the Toxic Avenger's wife is uh, uh, blind, uh, and she, she sees him for his inner beauty. Uh-huh. Oh, nice. And her name is either Phoebe or Claire, depending on which one you watch. They, change her, they keep changing her name and don't ever oh. explain why. <laughs> that is interesting. Ben's going to make it all better. <laughs> Never mind. Never even heard of that, so I'll yeah, look it you up. Have to go, do, it, do yourself a favor. It's a great movie. Okay. And you also took part in something called VHS Massacre 2, I saw? Yes, VHS Massacre 2. Uh, I've done a ton of um, shorts and other horror movies. I've, I've been working in movies for as long as I've been doing comedy. And uh, VHS Massacre 2 is a compilation of short films and fake trailers. One of our trauma characters is named uh, Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD. And he is a uh, cop who gets uh, blessed with uh, the powers of ancient Kabuki warriors. Uh, think of it as a uh, multicolored, multicultural Batman, uh, but very low budget. <laughs> and uh, that movie bombed horribly. It sounds so, like it so we made him into an alcoholic. And now in all the, in all the current movies, he's drunk all the time. And we did a uh, trailer for... Uh, April Fool's Day a number of years ago uh, called Kabuki Man versus Dracula where I'm Dracula and uh, <laughs> I thought it was the most obvious fake trailer in the world because it was all shot like in one location and the whole movie the whole like trailer is me trying to seduce him and then at the end, it's just Kabuki Man fucking me in the ass while I'm naked laughing. <laughs> and I thought it looked so fake, but all our fans are on the spectrum. So they still, to this day, think it was a trailer for a movie that we've never put out. And uh, my friends that, like, so we'll put out, uh, we have a lot of booths at, like, horror conventions or, like, movie conventions. And to this day, fans will walk up to the table and ask if they have kabuki man versus dracula on blu-ray and usually who's ever working the table will text me it's like we got another one oh, man. <laughs> it like, and it came that. out it came out on april fool's day like it couldn't have been more obviously not real <laughs> but yeah they included that in uh, vhs massacre too that's my birthday april fool's day so Thanks for putting out a movie. I'm going to check it out. Is it scary or no? It's just stupid. It sounds like a lot of the movies that you... It's not a movie. Yeah, it's it's a fake trailer. <laughs> we just talked about it's a no, fake trailer. it's a tra- fake trailer. I'm a girl. Don't. Don't. I, don't, don't Jesus Christ. Trailer, listen, we got Zach Amico. You need to listen. I am listening. <laughs> it's his aggressive New York tone. I'm just kidding. So <laughs> you're... I mean, you got comedy. You got the podcast three days a week. You got wrestling you're involved in move how i mean how do you fit all this in your schedule don't you also I'm a do busy something boy. for mtv yeah but i don't talk about that <laughs> i work on a tv show i work on yeah i have a i have a day gig on a tv show um but i don't want people i don't want crazy ass fan uh, uh i just i don't want people uh tweeting my day gig I was gonna say that's all you need is LOS fans to get a hold of that, and they'll just fucking yeah. run with it. Yeah, so I don't, I don't discuss that, but uh, it's fine. It's, people can know that I work there. Um, yeah, I'm a busy guy. Uh, uh, I try to split it up. Uh, wrestling is usually just on weekends. Movie stuff, I tend to like take a few months away from everything. Like uh, when we did Shitstorm, I uh, I was doing like one of the three episodes a week of Real Ass Podcast, and because uh, Troll movies, we shoot like 18 hour days. And uh, we pretty much all live together. Like you, you move into the production. Um, I lived at home for the last one, but on the first two movies, uh, we all moved to Buffalo, New York. Uh, actually, well, the New York side of Niagara Falls, and we shot in Buffalo. And uh, about eighty of us uh, moved into an abandoned funeral home. 
<laughs> that was our office living space and special effects workshop because the bottom was the uh, the morgue and it had drains in the floor. <laughs> so we do all our effects down there so that everything, all the blood and stuff would just go down the drains. Is it obvious that uh, you're in the, in a morgue? Um, yeah. So the movie we shot in a, in a high school that was two blocks away, mm -hmm. but um, yes, even gutted because the place had been closed since the nineties. I think we moved in in like 2012, oh. um, but it, and it was gutted. There was nothing left in it. But it's still, you can feel, like, just the um, architecture and the placement of the rooms, you know what a funeral home looks like in your head. Um, and, yeah, at nighttime, it, it was kind of like being in Phantasm. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was creepy. Yeah, that sounds horrible. Uh -oh. yeah. Does anybody it was a way seen? better when there was 80 of us than when there was, like, there was four <laughs> of us that moved in to get the house ready for the other 76 people. Jesus. Um, and that was really scary with it because it was like, it, yeah. it was huge. And we all slept in one tiny room together because nobody wanted to, <laughs> nobody wanted to sleep in like the big, because it's a big empty. We turned it to like a, basically a dormitory. That, and, I mean, uh, that sounds like fun, but it's freaky so as shit. Was this legitimately acquired or did you guys just squat in there? Because it was no, we, 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 we um, went through a uh, real estate agent. Okay, so it um, wasn't like condemned or anything. No, we actually had to get it up to code to get everybody to live oh, there. Shit. Okay. So that's why the first wave of us had to get it ready. And um, we had to like strip the floors and shit. But uh, yeah, we, uh, one of the things when you make a low budget movie is you kind of find people in smaller towns who are interested in getting into the industry. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll find a lawyer who will work for us for free because he's interested in getting into entertainment law and producing or a real estate agent who's interested in producing movies. That's kind of his foot in the door and he'll give us deals for the different things we need. Um, like we had a... Uh, we needed the school we shot in asked for a $3,000 donation in order for us to shoot there, which was very low. And then we found a local lawyer who gave us that $3,000 in exchange that his daughter would be like the head production assistant. Hmm. And then she quit after two days and he never <laughs> asked for his money back. Nice. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they want to ask, Zach, before I keep going? Uh, we, we talked about some of your least favorite guests. Who have been your favorite guests for Real Ass Podcast? Most recently, Jessica Kearson. Um, and then my favorites of all time, the exact person people you think, uh, Mark Norman, Dan Soder, um, just these, the, the, uh, Dan St. Germain, Mike Lawrence, all the people that I like, kind of looked up to when I first started doing comedy to get to like share my time with them now is very rewarding. And uh, it's just like, it, it, it feels great. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Were you there for the Jimmy episode? Of Where, rap? Yeah. Where Jimmy no, I don't. went hog wild at the end. Oh, you know what? No, I was not. Um, I thought, you know, I thought you were talking about Norton, not, uh, <laughs> I was trying to figure out what I was like, when the fuck was Norton on? Um, yeah, no, oh no, I was not there that day. I've managed to avoid a few of the really blown, the, for some reason I have pretty good luck with avoiding the crazy ones. Maybe you're I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know if it's, if that's part of my recipe or not, but, um, you kind of keep things yeah. light and funny. Yeah, I've avoided some of the blow-ups. I avoided that and the Nicole Arbor one, so I am very happy with myself. That one was – oh, that one fucking was intense. <laughs> Just her editing? Oh. oh, she was such a cunt. Uh, before we get into the, the last bit of it, I, you brought up the, the whole alt-right thing, how you guys got a lot of negative publicity. What do you – like, do you honestly think those people actually have seen your act or have listened to your podcast to realize a lot of it's just joke? No, I think it's a lot of out of context stuff. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the shit we say on paper looks horrible. But I mean, yeah, it's obviously we're joking. And then to lump us in with that, I mean, I'm an openly bisexual, liberal, uh, fucking half cat man. <laughs> or whatever I am. 
Uh, and then my best friends are a Puerto Rican and two Jews. Like to, to lump us in with that is bananas. Um, and even the people, it's obviously, it's what people don't realize. I think anymore is that it's just fun to say inappropriate things. It's fun to, for lack of a better term, it's fun to be bad. And the, the comedy character I play sometimes on these shows is just like in wrestling, a heel, a bad guy. And I say the worst thing possible to get the biggest reaction possible because it makes me laugh to see people get upset. <laughs> and it makes other people laugh to see me get people upset. So without context, I'm sure it's hard to distinguish that. And also without a sense of humor, I'm sure it's hard to distinguish that as well. <laughs> but I mean, for my entire life, I've always been the liberal one of my friend. Like I've always been the like bleeding heart liberal and to get uh, lumped in with all that was just like bananas. It was it was insane. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, they posted it on some Facebook. This guy that wrote this long, I don't know what it was. It wasn't an article. It was just this thing he printed out and he put on all the lamp posts around whatever comedy club you guys were at. That was at the creek, and yeah, he um he tried to say that we had Proud Boy tattoos. Yes. And he had pictures of everybody's tattoos saying that we had white supremacist tattoos. <laughs> people, I guess, have a lot of time on their hands. Yeah, and, uh, well, th I mean, that, that's just crazy people. The, yeah. Like, somebody that does anything like that, that's just mental illness. There's yeah. no, like, there's no benefit to what that person did, like. Yeah, yeah, there's no fucking reason for it either. And it's harder to come to that conclusion than the truth. Like, you have to take a further walk to get there than you do to go, oh, these guys are being stupid. <laughs> That's true. So speaking of tattoos, what's one tattoo you have on your body that you regret? Oh, none, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm covered, but I think every dumb tattoo I have is kind of just um, like if I was playing a video game, those are save points. <laughs> and that's another time in my life when I look at that tattoo I remember exactly what I was doing around that time you know who I was hanging out with what made me want to get it the story of that day so even my bad tattoos like my worst tattoo probably is I have let's see what side it's on right here this was it's supposed to be a DBB and it was the logo for my friend's company and I got it at a bar laying on a table for his release party for his book. And it's the worst tattoo I have. It healed horribly. Literally the person who owned the shop saw it and got mad at the artist and offered to redo it for me. But it was also one of my first dates with my wife. So I had like, even if it's a bad tattoo, I have that story around it and I don't want to change it because every little dumb thing on me yeah, it's just like another point in my life. I can remember what, nice you know, reminder. exactly what I was doing around that time. Is that a fat Marge Simpson on your arm? No, it's Barney dressed as Marge. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so just out of curiosity, out of everyone on the podcast, who do you think has a lip tattoo? Just tell me. <laughs> Rob. Why? Wave, what Rob. <laughs> It faded away. <laughs> Just like all your hopes and dreams. I'm sorry about it. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it's, it said, it. come here. Yeah, I, I, didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know come could make tattoos fade away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's got to sit there for a while. Just a pinch between your cheek and gum. <laughs> oh. Swish it around. Ugh. Oh. <laughs> got a visual. Um, <laughs> all right. So before we end it, we do this thing called Inside the Comic Studio. Brilliant. There we go. Um, before we get into it, though, plug anything you want, Zach. Great. Follow me on Instagram at Zach is not funny. Uh, check out my podcast, The Real Ass Podcast, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Gas Digital Network. Also on Gas Digital is Zach Amico's A Midnight Spook Show every Friday at midnight and Catalyst Wrestling every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, once again, those are all available. GasDigitalNetwork.com. Use the promo code ZAC Zach. You get yourself a month free trial. And uh, yeah, hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm. Uh, you can see the trailer online now. 
as well as uh, the movie should be coming out in the next few months. Sounds like you've said that numerous times, that whole that was, spiel. <laughs> that was the most professional plug I've ever right? heard. Right? <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> all right, Josh. Uh, at J means for all my social media and verbal insults, follow that page. And next week, Wednesday and Thursday, June 3rd and June 4th, I will be making my return to live stand-up comedy at Laughs Unlimited. Mm-hmm. Shows are at 7.30. If those sell out, they're doing 10 o'clock shows. Uh, 25% capacity, so who who knows um, what's going to happen. But, yeah, follow follow those social medias, Jack. At J means at verbal insults. The next right. one's June fifth. All right, Rob. Get my side project, Stand Up Dad's podcast. Uh, my buddy Mike and I talk about parenting, and we drop new episodes every Sunday. Danny. Uh, you can find me at Rad Chick Forever on all the social media sites, and that's it. All right, and follow me on Twitter at the Big Nick J. Okay, so I hate to ask this, Zach, but have you listened to the podcast? <laughs> this one? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I keep asking that because everybody's re- response is no, never. <laughs> I didn't even know we. Existed. I, I kind of stopped listening to comedy podcasts a few years ago just because um, I was afraid of parroting or like repeating things I had heard other people say. So mostly anything I listen to now is. Um, unless it's my friends and I'm just keeping up with them. Uh, usually it'll be like more like true crime and shit like that. Um, or like the Dana Gould hour where it's not like, it's more like informative as opposed to just comedy. I'm just so afraid of repeating somebody else's joke or, or having their voice in my head when I'm trying to come up with what I want to say. I don't think you would ever have to worry about that on this podcast, but yeah, I get what you're saying for sure. Go fuck yourself, Danny. All right. So we ask all comics the same five questions. So question number one is first joke that landed well. Oh, um, my first joke that landed well was I had a joke that was um, about how I always wanted to date an Arab girl. <laughs> and uh, not not because of looks, but because I'm really bad at Monopoly and I always wanted to uh, play against somebody who's not allowed to own property. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two. Uh, favorite thing about your local comedy scene? Hang. Um, the hang and the uh, especially on road gigs, the car rides. Uh, just because the shit we say on podcasts that people accuse us of being the worst people on earth for saying, <laughs> if there was a microphone in a nine hour car ride from Brooklyn <laughs> to Detroit. The shit we come out the the shit we talk and the insane stuff we say to make each other laugh is like I feel privileged that I get to be part of those conversations and no shit like I've heard comics that aren't even dirty comics say the most horrendous shit in the world to get a reaction from somebody else in the car. There's nothing more fun than comics just like dicking around when no one else is there. All right. Uh, what's one thing you dislike or would like to see change in your local comedy scene? Um, I actually wish that um, they would stop having ticket guys uh, in Times Square and stuff. And um, just because I used, I mean, that was actually how I got, I used to sell tickets myself and I've worked some of those Times Square, like tourist trap rooms. And I feel like they give a bad name to comedy or like, it's almost inviting the wrong people into the room. Like if you're dumb enough to think that Jerry Seinfeld and Chris Rock (laughs) are going to be on a $20 show together unannounced, you, de- you deserve to get ripped off, but that's not fun for anybody. Um, I just, yeah, I wish they would get rid of that practice or they would hold the ticket sellers accountable to actually selling the lineups of the shows because I feel like it, um, it re- makes a lot of young comics feel very dejected and it makes them abandon material that could be very funny one day because it's not working for those stupid people 
that go to the rooms that book the young comics. All right. Josh, did you encounter any of them when you went to New York? No. We, uh, when we were there, we were just there for Skankfest, and so we were just hanging out at the Brooklyn Bazaar all day. And then the day before Skankfest, we drove out to Jersey to – I had a gig opening for Florentine, but so I didn't see anybody there. Did you have to, like, submit, like, a request to be in Skankfest, or did you just buy tickets? I probably should ask you a while ago. Um, well, I submitted to be in Skankfest and they never got back to me. And then like three days before I hit them up saying I wanted to do the, the roast battle, roast masters, not even the naked roast. Um, or actually it was comedy fight club roast masters wasn't there, but they told me that Harrington was still booking people for the naked roast. And I said, I would love to do that. And it ended up working out. And the Naked Roast, like, not to suck my own dick on this one, but it is a show that, like, there's a line around the block to say, like, it's it's one of the the it's one of the shows everybody kind of wants to get in and see, and for lack of no pun intended, it's it's the best for exposure for young comics because if you kill on that, you're gonna have a great weekend of people remembering you. That's yeah, a hundred percent because. I didn't even really kill it, but throughout the rest of the weekend, I had people coming up to me saying, great dick, great job. That was <laughs> awesome. I had somebody at the McDonald's across the street. I was just getting lunch the next day, and he was like, what's up, bro? I saw your dick last night. And then <laughs> the McDonald's workers were like, what the fuck is going on? Let's go. All right, next question. Uh, your favorite local comedian? Local, so they're just favorite New York. I mean, Big J has been my favorite comic for a number of years. Um, but I guess for, as far as like old New York, it's probably um, Jim Norton. Uh, yeah, there's nobody that's more like influ- that's th- those two guys are probably the most influential to me. And as far as young people, I know he's not. Yeah, he, he's. I just think he's. His new special was so. Mark Norman is is the perfect New York comic. He puts in the most amount of time. He does the most shows. And if there was somebody I had a point to, that's like this is the guy that does everything right. It's Mark Norman. Who's a local up and comer that you think uh, we should look out for? Uh, there's a guy named Dalton Pruitt who I've seen do warm up for um comedy fight club twice at the stand and he's not a one-liner comic but he's a lot of like short jokes with misdirection and he's really fucking funny and really dark and he's got um he's got a great hold on uh uh twists on jokes and then i mean some of the the people that did roast masters with me are killed like ian Fidance, uh scott chaplin uh eli sayers and then uh, Keith Carey are people oh. that are all animal. Like, they're, they're so fucking funny. Great, great. All right, last question. Advice to new comedians. Don't be afraid to be you and do what makes you laugh and find other people who like what you like instead of trying to write to the whole room. Don't abandon a joke just because it's not working with one room. Try and find a way to make it work. And um, don't be afraid to be outrageous. Like, we're, we're clowns. And you can be silly and be nuts. And, uh, like, there's so many people that do comedy and aren't having fun up there. Have fun up there. And if everyone can tell you're having fun, they'll have fun with you. Damn good advice. Um, all right. Uh, last question before we let you go. What's one underground movie you think we should all watch at least once? trying to think of one that i would i mean to be honest my favorite movie it's troll movie so i apologize it's called tromeo and juliet it's from 1996 and it was uh written by james gunn who would go on to do the guardians of the galaxy films and it's uh basically a 90s sleazy romeo and juliet that takes place in manhattan and the narrator is lemmy from motorhead no shit Ah. (laughs) and it's really wild and it's uh that's probably my favorite movie uh of all time nice that's a big grab for a narrator fuck 
Well, he's in everything. We, he did um, most of our movies. Before he died, he played the president in uh, Return to Newcomb High. Uh, the last two I did. Uh, we went and shot with him at his hotel room when he was in town for a concert. And uh, he asked for he asked to be paid in a bottle of Maker's Mark. Wow. <laughs> That's true Let me fashion right there. <laughs> yeah, the last one we did before Shitstorm, uh, we had Lemmy, uh, and the narrator on that one was actually Stan Lee. Wow. Really? Damn. Um, yeah, and then the new one, who do we have? Um, of course, Ron Jeremy. He's in everything we do. Um, <laughs> and we have a lot of fun cameos in the new one. We have uh, uh, Ming from Comic Book Men. Uh, we have a couple really good bands. We actually have um, – some of the last podcasts on the left guys in uh, the movies, like uh, a bunch of uh, really, really funny, really funny people came and did uh, cameos. And I'm not allowed to talk about all of them yet. I'm thinking of a few that I can't say, um, but our movies usually are pretty, pretty laden with, uh, ca- with I can't believe that person's in this movie type cameos. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, anybody else before we go? Nope. Nope. Okay. Zach. Thank you so much for coming on this. Once Danny said you agreed to come on, I was fucking stoked. I was like, I love this guy. This is great. So thank, well, thank you. you so much, man. I really enjoyed it. And I appreciate you guys having me on. Well, Derek, oh, exactly. you, you're it. the, you're the funnier of the two on rap. <laughs> I would never say that. Well, I said it. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach. Thank you so thank much you. for coming on. Thank, thank you guys. Zach. Everybody have a great day and stay safe. Yeah, later. Bye-bye.